So uh, over the last few weeks, the brothers and sisters at Coventry West have been looking at this topic under these headings, and they are drawn from the book Phanerosis by Brother Thomas, of course, looking at all these aspects of the divine character and purpose. And it's useful just to, obviously I'm not going to talk about those tonight, it's useful just to step back though and just think about that word, uh, which isn't perhaps one that we use every day, certainly not one I use every day, and yet it is actually really at its heart, it's the idea of that which is shown, isn't it? That which is, as it says there, an expression or an exhibition of something. In the scriptures that very word is used, for example, in this case, as we read in Corinthians, it is by manifestation of the truth, that which is shown. Or in fact, as we find in the same chapter, that we should be always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest, might be made manifest in our body. Well, now that's fascinating, isn't it? Just right at the start. That there's a connection between the Lord Jesus Christ and his life and his death and our own individual experience and our own everyday lives. You can see the apostle is drawing a parallel and saying there is some connection there. Which of course is what it's all about, isn't it? It's all about the love of the Father shown in the Son. His ways, his character. And not only in one Son but in a multitude of sons and daughters who should reflect <coughs> him. That's at the very heart of that idea, isn't it? And as we read in Timothy, the same word again, without controversy, great is the mystery of God in this. God was manifest in the flesh, the work of the Lord Jesus in displaying the very character of God himself. Now, when we read through Daniel then, we're confronted, aren't we, with this great contrast. As we read through, we find, for example, in Daniel chapter 2, as we well know, that terrifying image that spoke of the kingdom of men. This is human dominion. And we find it in Daniel chapter 2 with the image and the four empires, and there it is in chapter 7 with the four beasts. But alongside it, and opposed to it, is the kingdom of God, represented by the stone in Daniel chapter 2, and by those figures of judgment that we find in chapter 7. So the opposition that in truth is there right from the beginning in Genesis, isn't it, between the ways of God, the great creator, and his creation, who has decided to go away from him, that opposition is there until the point where the Almighty completes his purpose in bringing humanity back to him for his glory and his purpose. Now, I'd like to start in Daniel 7, though, because there's a picture here that's a useful introduction to what we're thinking about. So we recall in Daniel 7, we have the beasts that represent the various empires, just as we have them in Daniel 2. And when we come to verse 9... In Daniel 7, we read that Daniel beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And it's not immediately evident from the verses to who the Ancient of Days is. After all, it could be all the, the Almighty, I, Yahweh, change not, we read. Or then again, it could be his son, couldn't it? Who is the same yesterday and today and forever. And at this point in the vision to which it refers would be taking action. Well, we just note that there in verse 9 as well, he is described as white as snow. And we're familiar with the idea throughout scripture of whiteness referring to innocence. So there's a purity associated with this thing. <coughs> Well, you recall how in this prophecy, rather as in the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the, the story, if you like, and then we have the explanation. We have the symbol, and then we have the interpretation. If we go down to verse 13, here it is. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like...
the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So now in this most interesting phrase, we have one like the Son of Man. A phrase that we know well. Well, it's applied, isn't it, in various places. Ezekiel himself is the Son of Man, but most particularly the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. But he's one like the Son of Man, isn't he? And look what happens in verse 14. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. So he... And you can then debate who the subject of the verse is referring to. Is it the Ancient of Days or is it the one like the Son of Man who's being given the kingdom? We'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Well, let's do that, shall we? Let's go to verse 22. Verse 21 tells us that the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. The ancient of days came and the saints possessed the kingdom. So we had two figures, remember. We had the ancient of days and we had the one like the son of man. And when the ancient of days came, the end result was that the kingdom was given to the saints. So if the two figures then are parallel, if the two series of verses are set alongside each other, then the Ancient of Days is none other than the Lord Jesus. And the one like the Son of Man is a picture of the saints. Certainly verse 22 is telling us that the saints are taking the kingdom. It, just consider again verse 26 where we read that the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume it and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and the dominion is given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Now, we just noticed, brothers and sisters, that the earlier reference we had to verse 9, the Ancient of Days whose garments white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool is a characteristic of Christ in Revelation chapter 1, and we shall see that a little bit later. Well, whichever way we look at it, brothers and sisters, and there, there are different ways of looking at this chapter, one thing is absolutely certain, it seems. And that is that the saints are involved in taking the kingdom. There is no possible question about that. The Lord Jesus is coming as the stone, which you recall is to smite the image and grind it to powder, and all of man's dominion is to cease, but the saints are involved in taking it. It's not that the Lord comes and then when everything's peaceful, the, the saints are brought in. They are with him in this picture. And we do well to consider that, brothers and sisters, don't we? When and as we wait for the coming of the Lord to recognise he wants us to be with him. And we'll just reflect on that. So certainly it seems then that when we look in the book of Daniel, we have... A terrible image which is going to be destroyed, which speaks of man's empire. And we have the Almighty who's bringing judgment in his Son. And in the one like the Son of Man. That's certainly the picture we seem to have in Daniel chapter 7. Now let's turn over to Daniel 10 then. And just read the start of the chapter we have there. Well we read of... The great vision that was shown to him of how he was in mourning for three weeks and how he ate no pleasant bread in verse 3. And then in verse 5, he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a certain man clothed in linen. And he's going to have a vision, the effect of which has a profound effect upon him. It, just um, to take the point from verse 16, look at the end of the verse there. Daniel says, O my Lord... By the vision, my sorrows have turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. Nebuchadnezzar was shown a vision of a fearsome image in Daniel chapter 2, remember, that terrified him. And now, the Lord, and now Daniel has seen something which also has a profound effect upon him too. These visions which speak of the way that the Almighty is going to intervene in human affairs have a profound effect both upon the godless and the godly. We desire to see their fulfilment for the honour of the Almighty 
and for the blessing of those who fear. And we should long, shouldn't we, brothers and sisters, to know, as Daniel did, what these things mean. You, you recall the words that we read, and we'll come back to them later. The man who was greatly beloved, who in verse 12, did set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. It wasn't just that he went into a corner and wanted to understand as some theoretical knowledge. He understood, brothers and sisters, that he might chasten himself, that he might live in a way that was in accordance with what he came to understand. It wasn't that the two was, was somehow separated. It affected him profoundly. His motivation and his thinking and his action was linked together, as indeed must be ours. What then of this certain man of whom we read in verse 5? Well, you might just see in the margin it talks of a one man in verse 5 against the word certain. And of course it is the same word that we read, for example, in Zechariah 14. That should say Zechariah, not Zechariah, shouldn't it? In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. So the word translated one is the same word translated certain here. In this first Daniel 10 and we have it again in Malachi chapter 2 have we not all one father hath not one God created us so it's clearly a sense of oneness coming out here that much is, is evident and that's why brothers and sisters that that phrase has been translated as a man of one there is a oneness about him and there's something very unusual about him as well. Verse 18 tells us the appearance of a man. As the appearance of a man. And verse 16 tells us he is like the similitude of the sons of Adam. And we might remember the phrase that we read just a moment ago in Daniel chapter 7 about one like the Son of Man. And recall that in Revelation chapter 1, which is based on very similar figures, we read one like unto the Son of Man. So as often in prophecy, things are not necessarily quite as they seem. They are representing something else, aren't they? I always think of, when I'm thinking of prophetic symbols, I'm always thinking of Joseph. And the cows, you know, the seven fat cows and the seven thin cows. The message was not about the cows. The cows were not the important thing. It was what the cows represented, wasn't it? It was the seven good years and the seven bad years. And it's as simple as that, once you know what the symbol is representing. And so throughout all prophetic scripture, and right into Revelation. Right? So here is a representation of something then. And that's what we're trying to get hold of. What is this man then going to be? He's going to be a man, you know, in opposition to the terrible image of chapter 2, isn't he? He's going to be God's man. He's one like the son of man who's doing God's bidding and doing his will. So when we talk then of God manifestation, brothers and sisters, which is obviously at the root of this subject, Let's just understand what we're saying and how it involves us. First of all, by going to John chapter 1. Here's a verse you know well, but I just want to show you it in a different context. Because John 1, of course, is describing, isn't it, the, the revelation of the character of the Lord Jesus. The one who was the word made flesh. The very character of God himself. His word and his purpose made living in a person, in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what John 1 verse 14 says, doesn't it? And then verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. This was the great quandary, wasn't it? How could you see the uncreate? He who dwells in light unapproachable, that no man hath seen nor can see. No man has seen God, but here's the beauty of it. But, says verse 18, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He has declared him. So you can't see God, but here's the Son who's declared him. And that means, says at least Strong, to consider out aloud. That is to rehearse or to unfold. There's an expression of him, a manifestation of the Father himself in the Son. The Word is now not just spoken or written, but lived in a person. Here is the very character of God himself, as we say. 
And that's wonderful. And when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, then you see, as Jesus himself said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And this was the purpose of God from the very beginning, wasn't it? When he created Adam and he made one, remember, in his image and likeness, one who reflected him in his character and in his ability to think and to reason. And yet that was lost, wasn't it? Because of sin. The ability to think is there, but now marred. And the tendency to go away from God rather than towards him. Until along comes the second Adam. Who indeed is, we read, the image of the invisible God. And who revealed his character and his ways. But it wasn't only to be one son then, was it? Because the Lord Jesus was to portray the Father and his children, those of the Lord Jesus, so to speak, spiritually, were to reflect him and his ways. That we should be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, says Romans 8 verse 29. We should be conformed to him and he to be the firstborn of many brethren. So there's the Father in his beauty and his glory. There's the Son who demonstrates him. Here are the children, I and the children whom thou hast given me, to be one with him in expressing that character in those ways. Now, come to 1 John chapter 4. And here in this beautiful description of the character of the Father and the love seen in the Son. Look at verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. You recognise the same words as we read in John 1. But see how he goes on. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is brought to perfection, to completion in us. And what's the point of that parallel? Surely it is this. That whereas the Son perfectly demonstrated the character of the Father, we in our turn, in the way that true love, not as the world sees, but as true love as the Father has revealed it, that would lay down our lives for each other, according to chapter 3, verse 16, that that love might be in us an expression to others in the world even by how we behave to each other of the character of God so we ourselves are in some way reflecting that which Christ did in demonstrating the character of God so this principle then of God manifesting himself not just in one son but in a multitude is at the very heart of our lives now and this is important, isn't it? I'm not so, only a couple of weeks ago, we had in Pershaw, we had what they call the Plum Festival. Uh, Pershaw is very big on the Plum Festival. They paint, they paint the town purple, literally. And uh, it's Pershaw's claim to fame. And we had a little stand there, and we we're trying to invite people to, to read the Bible and to, to understand about the things of God. And, and a gentleman came up to me and said, well, I'm an atheist. In fact, he said he was a happy humanist. And... Uh, he wanted me to understand what, you know, what good works he did, which I have no doubt he, he did. Um, but he wanted to let me know that he was quite happy with our God. And anyway, he said, what kind of a God is it who needs to create and to have other people to give him praise? He must have a lack of something if he needs other people to praise him. And I said, well, it's not quite the way I look at it. You know, I mean, if any of us who are parents recognize a relationship that we have with our children that is not so much necessarily about a lack in us as a desire to share and, and the love that we share and the reflection of those things that we share is more than a lack but then I thought about it later when we read in 1 Corinthians 13 only a few days later about the very nature of that love which is as I say not what the world understands well God had to have beings upon whom to show all the characteristics of that love, didn't he? You can't live really all of those characteristics of 1 Corinthians 13 if you're on a desert island. They exist with others. You can't show loving, you can't show long suffering, can you? Unless there is another being in need of long suffering upon whom to show it. You live in a family, brothers and sisters, and you soon learn 
well, well, my family need to show long suffering to me anyway. I don't know about you. So, so you see, these wonderful qualities exist and are exhibited in those where other people are involved. And the challenge to us each day in our own lives then is to reflect the character of God in, in all that we do then, isn't it? And that's how love brought to completion, says verse 17. Well, that is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. As God is and Christ is, is how we are. So this idea then is absolutely at the heart of our lives then, isn't it? Our desire to show the character and the nature of God in his love and in his truth, in his mercy and in his judgment, in his compassion and in his faithfulness. Not one side or the other, but both, in all aspects. Because we're going to see in this subject, both of those sides, both God's mercy and his love and his judgment, they both go together. They are both essential in God's character. And he never compromises one at the expense of the other. So it's there in all of the New Testament, isn't it? There's the body of Christ, the most extensive figure that we have in Romans and Corinthians. It's there in the apostles in Acts 13, who are going to be as a light to the Gentiles, quoting from Isaiah those words that were given about the Lord Jesus and they apply to themselves. It's about the beautiful feet of the apostles in Romans chapter 10, who take up the words applied to Messiah in Isaiah 52. So then, we have an image in Daniel 2, which is a terrible image to be destroyed, and we have a spiritual man figure. We have, I'm suggesting, one like the Son of Man, who is bringing judgment, both in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 10. And this picture, with thanks to Brother Jonathan Bowen for his image, describes to us how the Almighty has chosen to picture one like the Son of Man. This one man, this man of one. In other words, he's one man, but he represents a multitude. That's the point, isn't it? He's one individual by symbol who himself is encompassing a great deal more of others. And that's what we're going to think about. In fact, that's the wonder of television, isn't it? No, that surprised you. Because <laughs> as you all know, television is really two words. Right? It's television, isn't it? Vision is that which you see, and tele, well, that is that which is from a distance. So television is seeing from a distance. Never going to look at that box the same way again, are you? That's what this is about, brothers and sisters, to see what God has given us in his vision. Abraham saw my day. And rejoiced. He saw it from a distance. All the people in Hebrews chapter 11, they saw from a distance. They had television. They had much better television than they have today. They understood God's purpose and they saw it and they loved it. And because they embraced that hope, they based their life and they directed their lives towards it. And so must we, my brothers and sisters. That's why he's given us this vision. And it's not just then a vision of what the Lord will do when he comes, although it is. It's how he's brought us into that vision. When we see this, the prophet is inviting us to see ourselves in it. By his grace. It's a picture of all the saints brought together in him. So let's look at it, shall we? Verse 5. Back in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel 10 verse 5. Then I lifted up mine eyes. So often a, a phrase which is used when there's a vision, isn't there? And looked, and behold, this man of one, clothed in linen, from the very beginning, this idea of clothing has been associated with, and hasn't it, with the covering of man's nakedness, which was there because of sin and therefore came to represent it. And thou shalt make them then in breaches to cover their nakedness, so that when the priests came into the tabernacle, when they did their service, when they come near unto the altar to minister, that they bear not iniquity and die. And in all of God's dealings then with his people, 
He's brought them to understand the need of covering before him and the effect of sin and its cost. And significantly there in that picture in Revelation 19 of the saints who are going to be taken into the kingdom, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is, it is, in this picture, the righteousness of saints. Now, it's in the plural, the righteousnesses of saints. Some modern versions reflect that fact and have other words that reflect that. But here's the thing. We stand, don't we, in the mercy of God through his Son. The whole point of the law was to show that you could not rock up before the Almighty and demand eternal life because of what you had done. When we come to think about our position in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is because we are in him and we desire to be in him. For your life is hid with Christ in God, that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, you might appear with him in glory. And in the end, brothers and sisters, there is no hope for us except we are clothed in his righteousness. We shall be able to stand there and, and demand what is our right because we have done thus and so. And yet... The saints are clothed with righteousnesses. Now, what Brother Thomas said was this. In Anastasis, he says, If a man hath no righteousness of his own, Jesus Christ will refuse to be righteousness for him at the judgment. If a man have no righteousness of his own, Jesus Christ will refuse to be righteousness for him at the judgment. I think what he's saying is this. We must walk in light now doesn't mean that we are sinless. You know how the Apostle describes that in one job. But the manner of our life and the course of our direction and our ultimate heart's desire is to be like him. As we seek his mercy and his forgiveness and as day by day that which we do in our lives is not vain if it be done in the Lord. For that's what we read at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, isn't it? That your labour is not in vain in the Lord. What he notices... He knows our desire and our heart and is ready to forgive if we come to him in the right way and seek his mercy in the Lord Jesus. And in the end, our only salvation, I repeat, is through the work and the merits of the Lord Jesus. But there is a connection then between how we live now and what happens in that day. And that's the wonderful exhortation that on the one hand we should neither be cast down and despondent because of our failings, it is a reality for us, but nonetheless, that we should press on and desire to walk day by day in the light of his truth. That neither on the other should we be complacent to say, well, Christ has done it all then. Let us continue in sin because his grace is going to abandon. We can do what we like, which clearly would be wrong. Can you see the, the beauty of the balance of God's ways? That day by day, we must seek after him and his ways. And desire with all our heart to be like him, knowing that we will fail and seeking his mercy. So all the way through scripture then, nakedness is associated with iniquity and clothing of that, of that nakedness through the righteousness of Christ and the forgiveness that comes in him. And therefore the lesson for us, am I clothed with Christ? And am I walking in light? Is my every day characterised by that thinking? Is that my desire? And is that my direction and my goal in life? Is that my motivation for making my choices and my decisions? Does it govern my actions and my reactions to others? This is at the heart of this idea. As we seek God's mercy for ourselves. And as we seek to forgive and to walk with others. So that's the first characteristic of this representative man. Ultimately, he who is we, who are going to reflect God's character, have to start now. However failing, and you recall the words of the Apostle in Romans 7 where he says, you know, wretched man that I am, this is my desire, this is how it is with me. But the Lord knows my heart and my ultimate desire. And he goes on to talk of being girded with the fine gold of Euphrates, doesn't he, in verse 5? Whose loins were girded with fine gold. 
Now, girding up the loins in Scripture is that essential idea to make progress. You can't do anything with ungirded loins because you'd get trampled, tangled up in your skirt, wouldn't you? To be girded with fine gold. And you're familiar with the idea that all the way through Scripture, this gold speaks of tried faith, doesn't it? Gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. Well, faith is more precious than that. And faith is about believing God and taking him at his word, isn't it? Go right the way back to Abraham, the man who was God's friend. That that which God had promised, he was able also to perform. That's it. God said he would do it, and he believed he would do it. When God said he'd he'd take him from one land, he went to another. When he said you will have as many descendants as the stars in the sky, and he believed him. And that must be our attitude when God says he will do it. He said he will complete the good work he's begun in us, Philippians chapter 1. He'll bring it to perfection, to completion in the day of his son. If only we will hang on to him and seek him. And that's fine in the theory, isn't it, brothers and sisters? And when times are difficult, it's easy and natural to forget, perhaps, the reality of those statements. One thing to say, yes, the Lord will do as he has promised. But what about me in my life now, in my predicament? Well, interesting, isn't it, that Job chooses to reflect that very idea when he reflects on his own grievous burden and difficult trial. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You see, the gold of tried faith is hard won. It speaks of a refining process, doesn't it? It reflects the reality of how the Almighty has chosen to bring us through our experiences. The beauty of it is, brothers and sisters, we never know in any individual circumstance, in anything that happens to us, we never know how involved the Lord has been. But this we can say, at the very least, he has allowed it to happen, whatever it is. There may be things that reflect from our own choices, but in any of our circumstances, he has allowed it. And he's allowed it, brothers and sisters, for our ultimate good. There are things we are learning day by day, and we we don't know the end. And the Lord does, and we're thankful that he does, and that he is working with it. And faith saves. Whichever way it goes and whatever happens, I believe him. Just come to Psalm 45. I expect you know this picture, brothers and sisters, but... I find it very beautiful because it gives force and meaning to the challenges and the burdens that we bear. We who walk as frail creatures of the dust, which the Father remembers, who knows our frame and remembers that we are dust, knows that with which we struggle. In Psalm 45, you know, the man whose heart is bubbling over with this good matter of which he speaks about the king. And we don't have time to go in all into the beauty of the psalm, but you know verse 6 is quoted in Hebrews 1, and applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. The one who loves righteousness and hates wickedness, and whose garments in verse 8 are full of those things with which he was buried. And then there is a daughter in verse 10. He's going to consider and incline her ear, and forget her people, and so that the king shall greatly desire her beauty. And perhaps this is the king who has been waiting for his bride. Now she's to be brought to him in another figure for that, the beauty of the ecclesia brought to him, just as we have it in Ephesians 5, isn't it? And you notice the picture, don't you, in verse 13. The king's daughter is all glorious within. And some versions have decided that the within is within the palace, which isn't there in the original at all. She's not beautiful in the palace. It wouldn't matter whether she was in the palace or in the vineyard or by the beach or anywhere. It's not about that at all, is it? The beauty is within. For God does not look on the outside, but on the inside. In the meek heart and the quiet spirit. That in all our challenges and difficulties, the Lord knows, let us never say, brothers and sisters, whatever our challenges are, that the Lord does not know and he does not care. 
We may struggle, but let us never say he does not know and he does not care. Because look at the end of the verse. She who is beautiful within her clothing is of wrought gold. And it speaks of embroidery. I have to tell you, I'm not an expert in embroidery. I can see it. It's like a wonderful miracle when it's done. How it's done, I know not. But the end result here is that the embroidery is in the fine filigree tracery work. There is gold inwrought, embroidered into that garment. And the Lord is at work in our lives, in yours and mine, in all our experiences. That if we will only respond in the right way, he will just embroider all those beauteous parts of his tapestry that the gold of tried faith might be found. And he's still at work until the Lord comes while we're still alive. In all our difficulties, he's still making that garment that it might be revealed at the coming of the Lord. So let's just remember that. And ask ourselves that question. Am I allowing faith to be perfected by trial? It doesn't imply a pleasant or an easy process, does it? And seek the Lord's blessing and help. And seek to help each other as we wait for that day. Back to Daniel 10. So these are necessary parts of the work of the preparation of this one man. And in Daniel 10 verse 6. His body also was like the beryl. Well now, the beryl is interesting. The, the actual word used, interestingly enough, is Tarshish, which we're told means to break, to subdue, or to destroy. That would take no more significance of the word than that. It was there in the high priest's bless, breastplate, that, that is the stone, and there, I think it was on the third row, it represented Dan, who, the tribe of which spoke of judgment, so that the stone... The beryl stone comes to be associated with judgment. And I'm not going to follow the detail of it, but it seems that in the New Jerusalem Foundation in Revelation 21, the place where it occupies is actually Levi, which therefore speaks of a priesthood. So you can see that judgment is involved in the work, and also there's a priestly aspect to it. And this work then of this one like the Son of Man is going to, well we've seen it already haven't we, he is involved in the judgment which was given to the saints of the Most High. As the little stone begins to grow and to fill the earth in God's kingdom, it is all about the putting down of the enemies of God and the establishment of righteousness and his people are involved in it, which is what the toughness of the beryl would seem to signify. So Dan is the flesh judged, Beryl is the flesh subdued, and Levi is the flesh taught. That's how one writer puts it, I think, rather nicely. There's all of those aspects in this idea of the Beryl. And if I apply it to myself now, I say, well, do I judge myself now? That's the first challenge, isn't it? Those who are going to be honoured to share in the work of the Lord Jesus in ridding the world of sin have to start now. If I would judge myself now, I would not be condemned with the world, says the Apostle. I've got to look at my own life, haven't I? And I've got to say, well, well what is my motivation? What is my desire? And what, what do my choices reflect? For as a man thinks in his heart, that's how he really is. Guard your heart says the Proverbs, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, the, the outgoings then of life, Though that which comes to pass in your life, that which comes out ultimately in, in what happens, it all starts in here. Subdue the flesh, learn God's ways, that's what I need to do. And his face, verse 6, as the light well, there's another interesting angle we could take on this in Ezekiel chapter 1. Several of the figures that we have here in Daniel 10 are seen there in the cherubim in Daniel chapter 1. We'll have a look at one specific one in a moment. But for now, let's just understand there, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. 
Out of the fire went forth lightning. And here's the judgment aspect at work. As God is eliminating sin, that is objective, isn't it? For until sin is taken out of the way, there can be no righteousness. And until righteousness is established, there can be no peace. The world doesn't understand it. It doesn't want to know that. God has said it. And he will do it. And he will do it in his son. So it's a, a fa a, a, an aspect of God's work, as we find it in Psalm 18. In this case, for the deliverance of his people. He sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot his lightnings and discomforted them. And it's also associated with the glory of the redeemed. Here's another, another angle on it again in the Lord Jesus Christ in his transfiguration. His face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Purity and beauty and power are seen. He is the one who is righteous to judge because, well, he overcame sin in himself completely, didn't he? He took every thought captive in obedience as he calls on us to do. So, lightning, judgment and power. And here's the question I ask myself then. Do I remember? I will be judged by Christ. It's a living reality for me. But I might desire to keep my ways before him. Because he knows all, doesn't he? Verse 6. His eyes as lamps of fire. Now there's several features of the eyes as lamps of fire that are significant. One of them is chapter 3. Where again, without going into all the detail, there is Joshua, the high priest, who Zechariah 3 says, are men of sign. And the stone, which we've read of in Daniel chapter 2, that stone which is going to speak of, Brother Thomas says, intelligence and multitudinousness. It's not an easy word to say. Okay? Those two aspects have to be seen in the stone. And therefore, seven eyes are put there. Because the eye is that with which you see, isn't it? They are, says chapter 4, the eyes of the Lord, which run to and through, fro through the whole earth. And through the angelic host, the Almighty has been doing that, hasn't it, for centuries. But it's not to be Because the cherubim speak, don't they? Ezekiel chapter 10, of a multitude. Let's just go there, Ezekiel 10. Verse 9, and when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherubim, another wheel by another cherubim, the appearance of the wheels was as the colour of a beryl stone. You just notice we've already seen that. And as for their appearances, they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. Now, you go down to verse 12. Their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes. Even the wheels that they forehad. These representative creatures that speak of all the redeemed saints of the Almighty, gathered in from every race and from every generation. They all have eyes. Each eye is an individual saint. That just as the angels hold that role now, he's not put in subjection the world to come to the angels, says Hebrews 2. That's the work of the saints, isn't it? They are going to and fro over the earth. <coughs> and they are accomplishing God's judgments. They are lamps of fire here. Yeah. They're involved in God's judgments. As the lamp of fire is slaying the beast and giving it to the burning flame in Daniel chapter 7. So the eyes, and the same thing in Revelation, but I won't go there. The eyes are symbols of God's omniscience and his judgments. He who knows all, knows all about our lives. And there's the lesson for me now. Do I live in the recognition that God sees all now in my life? Sees into my heart and invites me to take the word, doesn't he? And apply it as the priest separated those parts of the animal. You know in Hebrews chapter 4, the sword of the spirit that divides asunder the very heart and the marrow and the joints and the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Feet and arms as polished brass. Well, they always speak of God's 
deliverance and his action in Exodus 6. I would redeem you with a stretched out arm. I think it was 75 times, I think, that I read that phrase, a stretched out arm, with great judgments. Joshua said unto the captains of the men of war, of those that he overcame, I will put your feet upon the necks of these kings. Have dominance over them. This is the Lord Jesus Christ reigning over his enemies. This is sin being destroyed as God will destroy and break Rahab or Egypt in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. So the arms and the feet speak of God's active involvement. As the feet, we've already referred to this verse, are also to do with God's ways and his truth and his invitation going forth. He's active, whether it be now in the day of opportunity, an invitation for others to join this man, or in the future, in that day of judgment, when sin might be put down and righteousness and peace established. Divine power and authority to save and to bring judgment. And it's polished brass. Because brass has to be refined, first of all. Impurities have to be skimmed out. And then it has to be burnished and polished. It suggests affliction that produces a bright finish. And we're back with that same image, haven't we? Of tried faith in a certain sense. Flesh. And it is the feet in Zechariah 14 who stand upon the Mount of Olives with the Lord Jesus Christ, accomplishing his purpose as he invites you and me, brothers and sisters, by his grace, to be part of that process. Do I remember God is ready to save? through his son, with all the challenges and the difficulties and the burdens, do I remember and seek after his salvation? And finally, it is the voice of a multitude. There are so many pictures, aren't there, in the New Testament of this idea, all the way from, in fact, from Ezekiel chapter 1 there, with the cherubim who speak with a voice of great waters as the noise of the Almighty and the noise of a host. Or as we find in Revelation, the, the waters which are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, as a great multitude and as the voice of mighty thunderings. This is the thing then. This man of one is one individual, but he speaks with the voice of a great multitude. This is all of God's people gathered together in one to praise and to honour his Father. A multitude speaking his words with one voice. So the challenge for me, day by day, is do I, as we read in 1 Peter 4, do I speak as the oracles of God? If any man speak, let him speak as be the oracles of God. We have no other commission and no other basis upon which to speak, do we? Apart from what's in this word. So there, briefly, are the seven steps to the man of one. They all have an aspect then in our own life. They speak of that yet greater being in the future, but they are there for us to reflect on and to live by day by day as we await the coming of the Lord Jesus and as we look forward to that kingdom. There is one like the Son of Man who brings judgment and he invites us to see ourselves now as part of him as we await the great and glorious day of his coming. And the challenge for us each one, brothers and sisters, is to hold that vision before us. The Lord knows our desires, he knows our difficulties, he knows our challenges and our burdens. And he desires us to keep that vision in our mind, to seek his mercy where we fail, and to look as the Lord Jesus did, beyond the trial and the difficulty, until the day when he makes it new, that we might be with him and found in him in that.